Welcome to night number three of uh, this is Bracket Racing uh, Elite Fest. Um, tonight I'm joined with Matt from Computech. Um, for those of you that don't know, Matt is kind of uh, the, the, the brains behind the new cloud weather station and in particular the new um, software that is both the weather station software as well as the um, it, it's like a prediction software also. And it's really cool. Like there's no like buy my weather station and go buy a three or four dollar program to go with it. They offer the weather station, the program in one complete package. Um, that that's really, really awesome. Um, this is actually, I know Luke and I have, you guys have probably heard Luke mention it a, a lot. I've been using the cloud weather station for probably three years now. Is that right? I think it's close to three years now, two, two to three years now on my own. And, uh, actually Luke came out and raced my stalker and like fell in love with it, went home, sold what he had before and got a Computech himself. And since then, uh, we both love them. And so, uh, and, and these days, um, you know, one of the things I want to mention historically, and I, and I think this is kind of brought up every once in a while within the group, like the need for a weather station is not that big of a deal in a bracket setting and the NHRA side, it's a huge deal. But let me tell you something with the way the bracket races are these days. And the fact that first round of one of these big dollar bracket races takes four or five hours. So you've got four or five hours between runs. Sometimes time runs today, first round tomorrow. Um, a lot of times there's no time runs on each day. You just go right in eliminations. All of these reasons are reasons that bracket racing, um, I think weather stations are as important as ever in bracket racing. So um, to get us kicked off tonight, Matt's going to take over here and uh, I actually um, gave him my database from uh, gave him my database from some of my races this fall in Vegas with my stock eliminator car. He has uh, he has that database. He's going to walk us through that whole thing and how to work it, how to enter a run, how the, everything about the software. He's going to take us through that. In the meantime, please use the Q and A function as we have the last couple nights. And uh, once he's done, kind of showing us the ropes, then he's here uh, to answer some questions. So. Uh, Without further ado, Matt, welcome. How are you guys doing? All right, so basically I'm going to walk you guys through uh, the software. Um, so when you first get the software, one of the, the biggest qualms that we typically get, and especially one of the, the things that might hold somebody back from the software is that it's, it's overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff going on here. When you first install it, this is kind of what you're gonna see. And there's a lot of icons, there's a lot of things going on. Um, we make it easier and the process easier for you by having a special area where when you first start the software, there's a new user wizard. And we will actually have a video that will play. You input all your information in and hit next. And now we go set up the cars. So we'll actually walk you through setting up each one of your cars. Um, as you can see here in the video, it's playing and showing you. It's even pointing to what we're doing and you can kind of see and walk along with it. So we try to make this introduction process as simple as possible. Um, the software is available for up to four cars. As you can see, Justin's got some of the cars in here. Um, we hit next, we'll go to the variables. Now, one of the cool things about this uh, entire program is that it is meant to keep track of absolutely everything on the car. So every variable you have in your car, every variable you have in your suspension, every variable you have uh, for tire pressure or run setup, we want to keep track of it so that we can know exactly what we did a year ago or a month ago at this track or that track. So to help make that easier, we have what's called a preloaded variable. And when you select this preloaded variable, it will make it so that each and every run, it's going to carry over the value from the run before. So if you put 10 PSI for the run before, the next time you go add a run, it's automatically going to have that in there. And this allows us to keep track of a lot of different variables without actually having to input it each and every time. Uh, so that's pretty powerful. The next thing is the categories. We then group each of those variables into categories. So we can have a carb category, we can have a suspension category. And what it does for us is it allows us to keep track and kind of group things together cohesively in a way that we can kind of move them around and see things in different combinations, which is racers, it really helps if we can focus on just our run prep before run and what we're doing there versus what happened at the top end versus what the engine was doing. Um, that makes a huge difference as far as being able to determine everything. Um, and then next we have views. So we actually use our views in two different places. We use it in the main logbook area 
and we use it when you're adding a run. Um, and the reason we have it in two ways is because we found that lots of times how you add information after a pass is a lot different than how you want to view it. So what this allows you to have is kind of one particular view where all your data is in an, a specific order and allows you to roll through it real quickly. But then you can have 10 different views for the finish line or run setup or the carb setup or whatever it may be. So that is uh, a, a nice aspect as well that it gives you the ability to see data in lots of different ways. Um, here we've got a simple area for tracks. Uh, one of the nice things you can put in with the radio is I always find that useful. Uh, we don't have to have any of this extra information. We just need to have an actual track name. Um, then we've got events, pretty much self-explanatory. We type in whatever the event name is. We can put information in here if we want. We don't have to. Um, and then here is the ad run, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So that was kind of the intro. When you first get the software, that will be the first thing that you see. And we walk you through that process of getting everything set up. So we try to make it a little less overwhelming and walk you through that. So now that we've got the weather, the, the software set up, we can connect the weather station. So I've got in my shop here, a race air cloud connected. And if I turn on power, it's gonna tell me right off the bat, hey, to ensure proper paging communication, turn it on and back off. So I'm gonna do that and kind of hear it click on and off. And now it is automatically logging the weather and saving the weather for us. Um, it's going to do this automatically and it's gonna save it by day. So if we go over here to existing weather day, we can see we've got a bunch of different days. And if it also senses that there is an event within those same days, it will kind of give you the event name along with it so that you know what event you're looking at. Um, so the weather is going to be saved automatically. You don't have to search for the com ports or uh, do anything like that in the past. It automatically finds the weather station, uh, makes it nice and easy for you. So now that we've got the weather connected and running, we could add a run. And when we add a run, it's all based off of the date and time. Um, we do it based off of that so that we can grab whatever weather sample it was when we just made a pass. So in this case, it's 11.05, um, it's about 8.08 .08 my time here. So let me do an 8.08 .08 sample, 8.08 p.m. And it hasn't logged the 8.08 .08 sample quite yet. So let me try 8.07. I might have to wait a second here to get some samples. But what it'll do in here in a second is it will automatically import that weather sample in for us. And then we just simply type in our different ET information. Here, the weather will automatically import. We have a nice section for notes. And then any other fields that aren't currently being used will show up in here as well. Um, so now I should have a sample. Real quick, Matt, while we're waiting for a couple samples, mm -hmm. just so everybody knows, is, is this the prediction end of this software is this included just with any weather station purchase? Like how do they go about getting this software? Yes, so if you purchase our race air cloud, the full software with the logbook and the prediction comes included with every one of our weather stations, every one of our cloud weather stations. So if you've got a cloud weather station, it comes with it completely. Uh, all you have to do is input in your weather station serial number when you register it and you're unlocked. We'll send you the unlock code. Um, so that makes, Life pretty easy here. Let me see if I've got an 809 sample now. Give me one second here. Let me restart this. Okay, let's try this again here. May not be liking my screen share. So eight, nine p.m. Zero is not working here. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but it does import the data. I'm sure Justin can attest to that. So when you do it, it will automatically import the data for you, import the weather. As long as there is a weather sample for that time, it's going to import it in. What this allows you to do as well is as long as you're logging your weather throughout the day, if you go back three days later because you didn't want to input that final pass of the day because you lost, 
you can input it in and it will automatically grab the weather for that date and time. Um, so that makes life pretty easy for you. Um, after the run, now we can pretty much do some ET prediction. So if I click on this and hit predict, right off the bat, it is giving me an ET prediction. And what I did was I just selected any cell inside of the run I wanna predict off of and hit the little predict icon here and it automatically pumps that run information over. And you can see 566 with the zero is here and it's now predicting that we're gonna run a 547 with a one. Um, uh, yep. Allie's watching and she said when you were trying to do that run entry that you had the date wrong. Ah, maybe that was what it was. Yeah, was paying attention. if you wanna make that work real quick, it's up to you. Ah, you're right, that is correct. So give me one second. Ah, uh, you know why? Cause it's, uh, it's Thank trying you. to tell you that you're typically on that. So let me try that real quick. Just so I can prove it's nice and happy. We'll try eight, 10 PM. Ah, there we go. Thank you very much. And there it is. There's our weather automatically imported in for us. So I'll go ahead and go back to predict here. All right. So one of the other things that you'll notice that just happened there is the predict tab. When we were in predict earlier and I hit to edit and add that run or to add a new run, it automatically opened up a new tab. And the reason for that is because in order for you to send a text message prediction or a paging prediction to uh, your page or a text message, we have to have a predict tab open. So as long as there is a predict tab open for that car and you've got a predict value in here, it's going to show it to you. So if you were to have the predict open and accidentally hit tracks or go somewhere else, we will open up a new tab and put it in there because we consider the prediction tab sacred. We wanna make sure that doesn't get deleted out of. Um, so now we've got our ET prediction. You'll see that this has got a lot of information here. Um, we've got our current temperature and values. Um, and now we've got the difference between I'm sorry, take that. This is the temperature and the uh, of what it was that previous pass. And the difference here, the humidity has gone up 14%. Uh, the sunlight has gone down 23% because I'm in my shop right now. The performance altitude has, has gotten better and has gone down 1766. So what will happen is we will give you visual cues as to what the weather change between the pass you're predicting off of, which is this one right here, and what it is now and if it hasn't changed much, it's going to give you a little dash. If it changed for the better, it's going to give you a green arrow. And if it's changed for the worse, it's going to give you a red arrow. And that's going to help give you those instant visual cues as to what has changed between the last pass and this pass. Okay, so we have here a formula selection. And we've got a lot of different formulas that we can select. Um, this is one of the things uh, I just want to mention while you're here. If you see these in here that are Bogacki, no wind, Bogacki with wind, blah, blah, blah. This is all the formulas that, that we basically give everybody on Elite as a starting point. Luke has worked with Matt and Computech to get those formulas already built in the software. So if you're already familiar with using Luke's eighth mile formula, it's here. You don't even have to, I mean, you don't, you don't have to change anything if that's what you currently use. Exactly. And, and not only that, but you're going to be able to truly customize it even further for yourself. And we're going to show you how to do that right now. So Justin's already got some custom formulas, as you can see here, Copo. Um, I'm going to switch to the Copo real quick because I'm personally a Camaro man myself. And we'll go to predict. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this predict tab here. And this is going to unlock a whole slew of extra features as far as prediction goes. I'm gonna to go to the fall nats here. And now you can see what we have is our prediction report card. So what this is doing is it's showing us here is every single pass, what the ET was during this event, what the performance altitude was and what the wind speed was. And what we do is we're essentially simulating after the fact, all of the different ET prediction formulas because we have all the weather samples. So we're saying based on the weather sample from here to here, our single run no wind formula was gonna predict you ran a, eight, a 989 with a four, which wasn't very good. We give you a D grade on that. And the single run with wind, basically the same, still a D grade. Well, if we scroll down here to Justin's custom formula, 
we can see he's got an A, an A, a D, C, A, and D. So we are customizing that formula already right off the bat. And he's already made some changes based off of the, the basic formula. And you can see here the quarter mile, yeah, I compare him right there. So here's the quarter mile Bagaki with wind and great formula, but he's customized his for his particular car. So he's been able to take that existing formula and fine tune it for this particular car and fine tune it for his other particular car. And we can see based off that data that it's now predicting more accurately than it would have if we just left it alone. Now, one of the things that we can do is we can customize this even further. So if we hit customize here, it's gonna give us an area where we can select any one of the formulas uh, we'll look at the Bagaki with wind first, since we were talking about that a second ago. Here is the formula you guys are essentially used to for the density altitude. Every 250 feet, it changes you a hundredth. Pressure uh, changes every one uh, tenth, changes you a hundredth. Vapor pressure, 0.07, and headwind, we've got it at 4.5. Uh, if we go to Justin's Copo, we'll see he's got a slightly different one. He's taking and negating out the vapor pressure by basically making it have to have a huge variable change. And then he's tweaked his other variables here. So we can easily go through and add and tweak and really modify this as much as we like. Now, one of the things that after talking to Justin, the Copo Camaro kind of hangs its wheels up in the air quite a bit. Uh, so it is pretty sensitive to wind um, and his formula doesn't have wind in here. So if we look at his formula right now, and we look at the headwind difference. Throughout the day, we didn't have too much headwind difference, a 1.8, maybe a 3.5, but right here, we went zero miles an hour to eight miles an hour of headwind. And you can see his formula did not pick it up well. Uh, it picked it up and gave it a D. Um, so if we wanted to, we could come down here and so, well, add- The other thing I wanted to mention too, everybody's probably looking at this scorecard and thinking like, holy cow, those Luke formulas like are terrible. This car is terrible. Um, although I've had success in it, this car dials worse than any race car I've ever owned. So like a normal formula would not make sense for this. And the reason is, is the engine is direct injected fuel injection where it injects fuel right in the combustion chamber. So it's super, super, super sensitive to temperature where like a normal car, like, anything with a carburetor or with port fuel injection would never be this bad. So that's why those other formulas are so far off. Right. And, and again, it's all about customizing the, the Bagaki formulas, the little, this, it, and actually I had it in as this is elite bracket racing, but it was a little too long. So I had to switch to Bagaki, but that's kind of a great starting point. And, and the ability to customize it is really where it gets powerful. So as we were saying here, we had a, a D value on that last run when the wind started kicking up. So if we wanted to, we could come down here, add compare. Here are all the different variables that we can compare. We're gonna select wind speed in this case and hit insert. And now we have wind speed. Um, I usually like around four or four miles an hour. So we'll throw it as a four for the moment and hit save. And it's automatically going to reanalyze our report card. And now if I come down here to his copo, now that D is turned into an A. So now when you go from a zero to eight mile an hour wind change, we've got a better handle on how the car is going to react to that based on some of this empirical data. And this is going to be something that's going to be fine tuned after each race. It's going to be something that after each race, if you can fine tune a little bit more and a little bit more, then you're going to find that you're ultimately getting tighter and tighter and tighter into that accuracy. So, um, one of the other things that we get a question for a lot is, okay, here is a huge formula. Here is a bunch of stuff. How do I know what number to put in here? How do I know whether I need to change this value? How do I know how sensitive my car is to some of these values? And we have a tool that, I'm gonna have to slide this down in a second, that is geared specifically to help us figure that out. So if you go to tune up, and you go to variable effect on ET, we can select a variable. And in this case, we'll go back to that eight mile an hour headwind change here and select a run. It's gonna tell you to go select a inside a cell. And now it is import that data in here. 
select another one to compare it to. And I'm going to select this one. And now it's showing us exactly how sensitive the, the headwind variable was on this particular pass. Now you have to take this with a grain of salt because there's a lot of variables when it comes to racing. And we're actually helping you cue into the fact that there are other variables by this little yellow sign right here. It's telling you, hey, your 60 foot was off by a decent amount on these two passes. So this may not be accurate information to go off of. So right off the bat, we find that we can use this tool, but these two passes may not be the best ones to go off of. So if we came over here and selected this 1.8, and then selected this one right here. We're off a little bit, but now we can see we've got about 3.3 .3 miles an hour of headwind change equals a tenth uh, or equals a hundredth. And that's pretty close to the prediction value that we just put in here uh, with the four that helped us get that A. So with his data, we were able to compare a couple runs and figure out kind of what that value should be. And this is a good starting point. Um, this is a really valuable tool to try to identify how sensitive your car is to those day to night changes. When the sun sets and the dew point sets in and everything is fogged up and condensation is built on everything, go find those passes. Compare the two, figure out how sensitive your car is to that humidity change or the humidity grain change, and then add that variable into it. And you'll find that ultimately you become a lot more accurate. You're able to start mastering those changes better than some of your competition because you have a formula that has been customized for your particular car based on your particular data. So that's kind of the, the prediction aspect. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of questions on that, but I'm gonna breeze through a couple other things real quick and then we'll pretty much open it up to Q&A at that point. Um, so one of the other things that we have in here is the find runs. Uh, this is a pretty powerful feature as well because we have the ability to search based on any values. So if I wanted to say, let's say I wanted to find where all the ETs were within two hundredths of the pass I just made. So that each time I come back and add a new pass, I get new data that shows me all my similar passes to what I just did. I can come in here and select this use most recent info it's automatically gonna grab the most recent run that the Copo 376 made. And now I'm gonna change this to 0.02 and we'll give it a save name of ET then 02 and find runs. And now you can see here's our 10.02 of the six, which was our last pass. And here are all the other runs that were similar. So now I can start to really see what the difference between those two is. Um, really fine tune and, and find data that's similar. You can do this the same with, let me see all my runs where my tire pressure was this low, or let me see the runs where the temperature was this low or whatever it may be. Um, so uh, the other nice thing is each of those searches that you saved are available as an event area down here. So when you click the event, we'll have a little divider and your most recent five searches will actually show up in here so you can access them quickly. Um, let's see. We also have a maintenance area. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Create a maintenance item like change oil, however many runs you've got when you want to warn yourself and you can perform uh, the service whenever you do. It'll actually log it as well. So you, this service log will fill out um, with, I changed the oil on October 13th. I changed the tires on October 23rd. And it allows you to kind of go back, when did I do this? How many runs do I have on this? So that will help keep track of it for you. Um, and then we've also got the standard tune-up programs for Holly Jet to maintain uh, Precision Jet. Um, and then also the single run uh, prediction and the run completer as well. So that's kind of the gist of the program. Um, honestly, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a, a lot inside of the software. And I actually talked to a customer just a couple of days ago that said, I'm 60 some years old. And when I first got it, it was a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot of stuff going on in here. But once I kind of played with it and started using it, it was all kind of intuitive and just kind of made sense. 
And that's really what we're going after. We're trying to make something that's intuitive and just makes sense. Uh, and to that degree, we actually have built in, or I, I have built myself into the help system. So no matter what screen you're in, if you're in tune up and hit the help button, you are going to get a video specific for tune up. So it will go through and tell you how to use everything inside of the software. Um, it usually has audio, but because we're at the racetrack, usually I actually put in subtitles. So even if you can't hear me, you can at least read me. So um, some of these videos can be five minutes long, but I wanted to make it where if you weren't sure how to do something, you could hit the help video and I would explain everything there is to know inside of that screen. Um, so it might be a little long, but it's also really good training. So if you wanted to kind of learn a little bit more about how the views work or how the ad run works, uh, you can hit that help button and it's going to walk you through that video. Matt, do you mind going through um, one of the other good features, I think, is when you have a round where you lifted. Maybe we could just make up some numbers from my Copo. Yeah, give me one second here. Let me do And it. show the run completion. So let me go to this car. I think I've got a pass I can probably tweak. Okay, so let's say this pass right here, we were adding this run in naturally. Now, this way the software is, is it is designed and built to learn your car. And it goes through a formula after each pass where it, it kind of understands whether you lifted the car or not. And after you've input about five good runs that you've told it, hey, these are good runs, add it to my database. Now it will start understanding what a full pass is and what not a full pass is. So even if you, once you've got the database going a little bit, even if you don't select, no, this was not a full run, lots of times it will sense, hey, this wasn't a full run. Let me ask you if this was a full run. Um, but you can trigger it by saying, no, this was not a full run. So we told it it wasn't a full run. We're gonna hit update. It's gonna give us this window right here. And it says, it appears this was not a full run. And we've got three options. We can tell it, yes, this was a full run, which will help it to learn your car better. We can say, no, this wasn't a full run. Use it off my database and auto-complete it. Or uh, no, it's not a full run, but do not auto-complete it. Don't leave it alone. I don't want you messing with it. I don't want you doing anything. So in this case, we're going to say, yes, it was a full run, auto-complete. Now, this run might have got input into the database here, so it might give us the same number. Nope, it didn't. Good. Okay. So what it did was we originally had in the eighth mile ET 5.574 in that field. And when we hit to auto-complete, what it did is it moved that value to the lifted ET field. It then went and looked at your entire database and found the run that was closest to the interval and then used our run completion formula to predict what you would have run. So we are using your own data. We are automatically searching your good runs for the closest possible run to the run you just made. And then we're auto completing it for you. Now, one of the confusing things that we do is we move the lifted ET into this new field called lifted ET. And the, there's a couple of reasons we do this. One, when you're looking at your data and you're going along, okay, I run a 558 with seven, a 561 with a two. If this was a 570, it wouldn't make sense. It'd, it'd instantly be, hey, this isn't good data. It was, a, I'm not sure what the car would have ran. By putting what the run completion run was in here, we give that instant visual feedback of here is the tra trajectory the car is going along. It also allows us to predict off of every single run in the database. So for instance, Justin lots of times will, and all of us do, we'll suck it up at the finish line and we'll hit the brakes two, three, four passes in a row. And before you know it, your last full pass was early in the morning. And if you wanna predict off of a full pass, you're going all the way back there. So by having this ability to auto-complete it gives you that ability to keep predicting off of the most recent conditions, the recent track conditions, the recent weather conditions. And we're getting a good idea as to what the car actually ran because we're using your own data. So that's pretty much that. Sorry, I'm muted, Matt. Um, oh, no 
uh, hold on one second. So um, I have a question about that. What does it have like essentially like a formula or an editable formula for run completion? It does not have a editable run formula. Um, but what it does is it has a database and you can see here that this is your own, this is your database, Justin. So if you go and look at your software and expand your predict, you'll see that there are certain runs that you have told it in the software when you were adding that this was a good full run and it learned it and it's using those runs as runs to predict off of. So right. if we did accidentally add one that we didn't want to, we could either remove it. Um, if you go to the cars area, there's also a clear prediction setup, which will clear that little database and allow you to kind of start fresh. So if you made a huge setup change, go ahead and clear the prediction setup database. And now you're going to be operating on more accurate information in the future. Okay. That makes sense. Um, now I real, real quick, the other thing, if I can get to it real quick, when we were looking at that, if the formula, if the, the value we corrected for you, if you don't think that is accurate, you can very easily come back in here and then just edit that to something different. And instantly now we've got that value in there instead of that one. So we will auto correct it for you. We will reduce the run completion formula for you. And then if you find that, uh, you know what, I don't think it would have been that fast, go tweak it yourself. And now you're using and predicting data off of what you thought it was. We're just, the software can only do so much. So if you, if you know there was track conditions that, that would have changed it differently, then by all means, go in and tweak it. But it's a great starting point for instantly being able to tell, here's what I would have run. And it does it instantaneously too. So, I mean, you come back and type in the ET slip and hit update and instantly it's telling you exactly what you would have ran. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna bring, uh, Greg Newman actually has a question. Um, so I'm bringing him on now. Greg, go ahead and unmute. Can you hear me, bud? Yeah, I'm here. All right. So um, I see on that, you have the time on your um, add run feature because I I've been doing this for two months now. I just got it, so I I really enjoy it, and I've been trying to predict junior dragsters, and we all know how easy that is. But um, how do I get my time on on that area right there? Okay, so this area right here is based on the views, so, and this is one of the more complicated aspects of the program, um, but it, it's, it's kind of important uh, and, and powerful. So if I go to important category, and if I show my quarter mile view, you'll see here that in the quarter mile view, the important is at the very top. And if you, I look at the important category, I've got round, time, performance, altitude, and headwind. So if I felt that, let's say humidity was extremely important, I always wanted to know that, I can throw it up there. Let's say, for instance, Justin does a lot of the NHRA racing. So he does a lot of multi-day racing. So sometimes it's helpful to see that that date is different. So we'll come up here and we'll make the date stick up here at the top. And now, as long as I, as I save my changes, now we've got the date and now we've got the humidity. So this all goes back to those categories that we can customize. And lots of times what I'll do is I've, like I said, I've got lots of different categories. I've got categories that show me my run setup where I've got my tire pressure and my launch RPMs for the junior dragster um, and the cylinder head temperature so that I can see how consistent it was, how consistent I to do my job at the start. Um, then I've got other ones that show the, the top end and stuff like that. And other ones that focus on the weather uh, and the weather very, shoot, I even have an important weather category where I focus on instead of showing all of the different weather variables, lots of times I cut out some of the weather variables and focus on just the ones I want. So a lot of the times it's about tweaking the database and tweaking it for your particular application. And although it's a little scary to do it first, once you kind of get the hang of it, it's pretty easy. Well, yeah, that's what I like about it is because you can, you can literally measure anything you want. And then if you don't want to measure it, you can take it out. But how many good runs do you need to put in before you feel confident about predicting anything? 
The prediction is something that uh, it really I like to have a full event. And the reason I like to have a full event before I start feeling comfortable in the prediction is because a full event allows me to get Matt, uh, Greg, can you hear him? I can't hear him, no. I, I can, Matt, for some reason, your sound just dropped out, bud. Uh-oh, hold on. Can you guys hear me now? Now we can. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. I think my microphone automatically muted me for some reason. Um, so really, I like to get a full event under my belt before I start really trusting the ET prediction. And the reason for that is because the prediction tools that we have here are extremely powerful. The ability to see if I use this formula last week, how accurate would it have been? And then to customize it and then it automatically reanalyze that event allows you to just like we saw earlier when I used Justin's data. He had a D in that one grade. We added a win variable and now it became an A. And you can slowly fine tune those variables. And essentially what happens is if you spend the time during the week outside of the racetrack, fine tuning this formula, the next time you go to the track, the confidence level you have is through the roof because you know you're using a formula that is particular for your car. And you know you use, you're using a formula that if you had it last week, you would have gone a lot more rounds because now that it's customized for you, it would have been deadly last week. Now that could mean this week it's going to be a little different. And that's part of what that fine tuning over time is all about. But really, I'd like to get one full event in and then start really fine tuning it with the prediction tools. The other thing that I would mention is that like for me, I manually have always done my weather like with a my regular log book and a calculator right and so I had a formula for each of my cars quarter mile eighth mile dragster door car I have my formulas so what I did is uh I I essentially created a formula titled my copo 376 right and and I started with that and then I let the I basically let the program make my formula even better. So like I kind of had a starting place. So if you already have a way that you predict your junior dragster that works for you, that's close, you can start with that and then just allow the program to fine tune that over time. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yep. Cool, thank you, Greg. And then also I'm, I'm, I'm in the junior dragster world. So we're, there, we're always tweaking the junior dragster stuff. So keep, keep out next season for new stuff. Yeah, I, they're not easy. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you, Greg. I got Jordan on now. He's got a couple of questions. And one of uh, Jordan's questions is going to also answer Jim Oliver's question, I believe. So. Hey, Matt. So my first question was when you were talking about how to figure out weather ratios and you had the those three columns um, and the middle one would turn yellow if like your 60 foot moved or something like that. I was wondering if when you're in that screen, does it allow you to change the 60 foot and, and make it like normalize it like if if the runs had the same 60 foot how did the wind change the run it does not and 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 maybe down the road i will try to do something along those lines but the problem is there's there's a lot of variables at play um and what we're really trying to do when we're comparing these is we're trying to focus on one particular variable um that can affect the et uh, whether it be uh, a, a headwind variable, or you can even do a tire pressure. If you made a tire pressure change between two passes, it'll help tell you that. Now, I will say, and, and I didn't bring it up at the time, you see here it says corrected for weather. It is actually going to kind of demonstrate it here. It will actually standardize and tell you based on if this run was made with perfect weather, this is what the ET would have been. So you see that the ET between the two was 5.587. Corrected to perfect weather, it was 5.56. This one was 5.61. Corrected to perfect weather was 5.578. So what we actually do is we correct it. We pull the weather variables out as much as we possibly can so that then we are focusing on just something like headwind or just something like tire pressure or just humidity or whatever it may be. Gotcha. That makes sense. 
Is there um, a way, real quick, not to interrupt, but is there a way to actually put that corrected ET for every run in the logbook? Um, there is not yet, but I can probably add it pretty easily um, in a new update where basically, um, and I actually just did it here recently, and I can kind of show it. Um, well, because to be honest with you, I write down in my logbook like the standard correction, and then I correct my ET after that so that I, like at the end of the week, and I can go back and compare like what I ran corrected in all of my runs. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. The cool thing is that the, uh, the variables here, and I finally finished building it out, it actually has custom calculated uh, variables. So it's got the ability to, and I don't have any default at the moment, but it's got the ability where you can create your own variable based on other variables. So um, yeah, adding something where uh, I had a variable that showed you the standard ET um, that pulled the weather out of it. Yeah, that's definitely possible. And I can probably have it in one of the updates. I'll add it to my list. Cool. So that is also one of the other cool things about this because I'm coding it personally. I designed it personally. If there's an update or a suggestion, I, I've got plenty of suggestions from customers using the software. I can only use it so much. I can only use it in so many different ways. So if you guys find something that's useful or doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to, by all means, reach out to me and it's, it'll, it'll get fixed in the update. Matt, I know with your, you're pretty good with computers and stuff, but if you ever need any help, I can turn on a computer as good as anybody. Turn it on <laughs> and off. I'm really good with the power button. Luckily, I, luckily, honestly, I will say that with this software, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's user intuitive enough or whether the help videos have been helping a lot, but I don't get a lot of questions with the software, surprisingly. Oh, that's awesome. All right, Jordan, sorry to interrupt you, bud. No problem. So uh, another question I had was if someone has another weather station, like a, a different brand, can they use this software or is this only for CompuTech weather station? Okay. So obviously I'm biased to our weather stations. Um, our weather stations are also the only weather stations on the market that are actually custom calibrated. So we have a custom calibration tank that will drop it down to 50 degrees, expose it to 80 degrees, 40, 20% uh, humidity, 80% humidity, uh, 29, uh, 24, 50, all the way up to 30, 50. So we expose it to all those variables to make sure that they're all very accurate. So we kind of have a little higher standard as far as weather goes. So ours is the only one it will work with and import the weather automatically. Now, that being said, if you've got another weather station and you want to try out the software and you want to get it that way, you can easily, when you're going and adding this run, if I were to type in, some weather variables, it is automatically going to correct that for me. It will even go as far as, let's say I'm just going off the flag because I don't have an actual wind speed. I'm going to say it was five miles an hour and it was, it was let's say, 15 degrees. Um, it'll calculate the headwind for you as well. So it's going to help calculate that for you so you don't have to have our race air cloud weather station. You can use a handheld weather station. You can use one of our competitors' weather stations. The only downfall is you're going to have to import it in uh, each time. The big downfall to, to using another weather station, unfortunately, is we're saving every single weather sample throughout the day. Um, so when we open up a weather sample, we've got every single sample. So if you made a pass at 837, I know exactly what the weather was at 837. So having that our weather station tied in and every single sample, every single minute, make sure we're getting really accurate information. And lots of times it's just about not making poor choices. I mean, there's been plenty of times where, especially in the junior dragster world, if you go out there and the, the wind gusted really bad, those cars will slow down a ton. And if you didn't see that this headwind gusted during that exact minute, then you would assume the cars are starting to slow down. But with that data, you can see, oh, I had a 10 mile an hour gust right there. And usually it's been at like three to five miles an hour. So although the car slowed down a lot that run, it's probably not going to stay that way because I know why it slowed down that run. So that's also another advantage of using the cloud weather station with it as well. Gotcha. That makes sense. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Jordan. I got Woody on here now. Uh, hold on a second. Let me get Woody to... Can you hear me, bud? 
Yeah, I'm I'm coming here. I, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear. Oh, okay. Um, I think if I go back and ask my my question and what I had early, I don't know if you see me or not, but oh, um, what was what was my question? I forgot. Dustin. Uh, it was what is the legitimate distance for a pager? Like if you're usually parked in the back 120 instead of <laughs> of the 40 acres, right? That's <laughs> correct. The, the Race Air Cloud, we, we redesigned the way we page with the Race Air Cloud. Um, the old unit had the paging, the Race Air Remote, our previous generation, had the transmitter in that little black box that would be inside the trailer. And then we then had an antenna cable, like a 20 foot antenna cable that ran up the trailer and to an antenna. And what happened was that antenna cable, we would get a lot of signal loss and wattage loss on that. So we've actually put the transmitter up in the air with the weather station itself. And that has significantly increased the range over what we had in the past. So I know in the past we had close to two miles. I've had customers tell me they've got almost three miles out of the, the new one. Um, oh, great. That is going to be dependent to a certain degree based on what you are around. If you park right next to the tower and then try to get it or next to a big building and then try to get the signal a mile away. Well, that big building is blocking a huge section of that signal. Um, so you may not get the best signal in that case. Um, but that's also part of the reason why it's up in on the, the, the pole and up at high in the air. Um, we're able to get beyond those stacker trailers and, and get that signal out into the air and bouncing off the atmosphere enough. Okay, I mean, I know sometimes I've been at places, and like I said in my question, I'll be backed over on the 120 instead of the, the 40 acres where all the other stackers are at, and I just, you know, just trying to make sure that when I do get down to the staging lanes that, you know, I'll, I'll be able to get all clear signal coming from the trailers off. Yep, I'll be honest. I, the, the race air remote weather station, we would get some paging distance issues. And sometimes we'd have to replace the paging wattage, the transmitter inside, because the wattage just wasn't strong enough. Uh, the yeah. cloud we've had out for close to three, four years now. And I don't think I've had a single customer that's actually had a paging issue besides one pro team that parked next to the media outlet and had something interfering with it. Um, oh. But other than that, it's, it's, it's stout. If you've got the paging, you are guaranteed to get your signal pretty much anywhere at the racetrack. Uh, well, the texting option is going to be a little bit more difficult because you're going to be dependent on the internet signal. Okay, well, after you went in 10 minutes, I'm, I'm sold on the system. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to get it and, and try it out because I'm all, I used to be, I remember back when I first started out racing, you know, I didn't think about things like this. And then as I kept racing more, you know, and seeing the, the changes, the way the car was reacting to the weather. Well, then of course I started keeping a log book. And I used to, I went and got me one of those little $20. They had the barometer and the temp and the humidity. And that's how I started out. And so now with, with the technology, like you have presented here, I'm sold on this and I'm, I can't wait to, you know, be like the other racer that was talking about, you know, how easy this is to work. So you've been very helpful and I really appreciate it. So Thank that's you. all good night. So, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate this. Good. I, I, honestly, we've tried to make this as easy as possible. Uh, we've tried to make it, I'm, I'm basically trying to build the Microsoft office for, for drag racing. Um, and it's a, a daunting task, but I think we're slowly getting there. The other thing well, I want to make mention of real quick, and this is going to, uh, Allison Dahl also asked this, but I don't actually use the texting, I don't use the uh, paging, I actually use the texting feature. The, the drawback is, is the fact that you need to have internet in your trailer. I just always do because, you know, on the NHRA side of things, um, you know, we're constantly looking online at the results or the live timing or the ladder or all of the above. So I have internet in my trailer, but as long as you have internet in your trailer, it will text you all the weather, the predictions, everything right to your phone. Yep. And you can also send start and stop to the text message phone number. It'll be the same phone number we text you from all the time. So you can actually save it in your phone as a contact of race base. And if you send start and stop, you can kind of toggle it on and off. So if you go up to the staging lane and you're like, oh, I forgot to turn it on, just send start and you start getting the text messages. And the real nice thing is, whether it be the text messages or the pages, when you're in the staging lanes and you're about to make that, that final decision of what to put on the dialing board, you can go back two, three samples and, and, and pages and see a kind of general trend. Okay, I, 
83, 82, 83. All right, I'm going to dial an 83. So that's definitely helpful as well. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for the question, Woody. I'm going to ask a couple questions here. Um, some of them that have quicker answers than other. Jeff Rigney asked, uh, does the software run on all operating systems like Apple and Windows? So it's on Windows. Um, it will run on Mac if you're running a, uh, the Parallels. So it works fine with Parallels. And I will probably have the Mac running here pretty soon um, because we are working on a phone application as well. So once I get to the Mac, that's kind of tied in together. Awesome. Okay. And then uh, Sean Clark asked, does it allow you, is it allow you to track or calculate ET intervals like 60 to 330, 330 to 660, et cetera? Yes, it does. So, um, and I don't have, actually, I didn't update my own software, but the latest software will actually have a 330 to uh, 60 to 330, 330 to eighth and all of those different aspects. Um, we also have a comparator here that will compare from one pass to the other, what the difference was. Um, so that's usually pretty helpful as well. Um, and yes, we do have, I can't believe I didn't update my own software, but yes, we do have the latest update that I just made the last uh, couple of weeks ago gives you the intervals as well. Okay, cool. And then I just want to make note too, um, all of the updates like are obviously a, a free thing. You just go to the website and update real quick. It's, it's really, really simple. Like even I can do it. Yep. Uh, um, Chris Ratchford asked on the junior dragster side, can you predict weight adjustments also? Ha, yes. And this is... Uh, Hits, hits close to home for me uh, because my son is doing junior, junior dragsters and we are actually going to attempt our first PDRA championship next year. Uh, so obviously that's going to be even more important. So if I go to the custom formulas, we have a junior dragster index with wind. So what we do here is we've got two things that are happening or actually we've got a couple things that are happening. The first is that we have got our desired ET. So in this case, it's starting at a 790. If you are the type that likes to hold a number or even two numbers, you can put in your desired ET of 788. So you can change this to whatever you want if you like to hold that number. Um, the next thing is we are using a particular ET prediction formula. So when we do our weights prediction, we're actually doing two separate formulas. We're doing an ET prediction based on what the weather was to figure out the car is going to run. Then we then do a secondary calculation that will adjust the weight so we can get to that particular ET. So what we've done is we allow you to select your particular formula that you are using. And the reason for this is if you're customizing your particular formula for junior dragster with wind, and let's say you've got three or four other variables. Well, if you then go to, if you've customized this a couple of times, and now you want to customize the wind, we then have to replicate all of the same things that we did on that ET prediction exactly the way we did before. So this way it allows you to constantly be tweaking your ET prediction formula. And then when necessary, you can use this weight. Um, now when we use the weight, I don't, Justin doesn't have any sample data, um, but when you do the weight prediction, instead of predicted ET, it will actually say, uh, weight in tank. And what it will text you is the amount of weight you should have in your variable weight tank. And you'll have a little value right here that tells you how much weight you're changing. I'm dropping three pounds. Um, and the reason for this is it, it allows you to, when you're in the staging lanes and you're getting those predictions, you'll see 11 pounds, 11 pounds, 12 pounds, 11 pounds, 12 pounds. And at the last second, you can make a choice. Okay, I need to have 11 pounds in the variable weight tank. And as always, all of this data, it is gathering is coming from your information. And you'll see there is a variable weight field that is unused for Justin since he's not junior drag racing. Um, and that is where you would put in whatever was in the variable weight tank. Now, I also have, if you are doing junior dragsters and you're doing... Uh, specifically that aspect. If you go to our Facebook page, there is a video that will walk you specifically through all of that aspect of doing the junior dragster weight prediction. So if you can't quite remember it and you want to reference it later, just go to our Facebook page and we've got videos there as well. 
Awesome. That's really cool. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to do the same thing before too long. I have a feeling. <laughs> I raised junior directors myself and I remember what a pain they were, but this I'm trying help. to make it easier. And our new, I'm, I'm working on a new data logger for the juniors as well. So hopefully that will uh, tie into this and, and make junior life a lot easier. Right. Um, so kind of related to that, Mark Sullen just asked, he, he and his son both double enter the same car, big car, obviously. And there's a 70 pounds weight difference between the two of them. Is there any kind of way to predict that with the ET like, you know what I'm saying? Like if his son goes and makes a run and goes 550 and is there a way to. Honestly, I, the software, there's, there's not a way to do it. And I'm not sure this, there should be a way to do it. And the reason I say that is because that weight change is going to change, not just the ET, but it's going to change the launch. It's going to change how it's getting through the gears a little bit because of that different weight change. So what I would probably recommend doing is, unfortunately creating two separate cars um, and then and putting it in as two separate cars. The other aspect is if you did have it as, as a single car, uh, it, it can get confusing as Justin can attest to when he does some uh, multi events in the same weekend. And if you don't get the events correctly in there, it can be a little confusing, but uh, yeah, I would probably in that case do it as two separate cars um, and then just kind of look at each other's data. Did you pick up, how much did you pick up or slow down? And that might be the better way to, to typically judge that. Okay, cool. And then how about, uh, how often do you need to update? Like, I know it's whenever you do an update, but roughly how often is that? At this point, there's not a lot of bug updates that are happening. Um, so at this point, a lot of the updates are feature updates, uh, like the, com oh, not a good run there, but uh, the compare aspect. Um, one of the other really nice updates that we just made recently that Justin, you may not even be aware of is the notes aspect that allows you to basically have a blank piece of paper that's associated with the entire event. Okay. Um, so I actually use this a lot. Um, any kind of freehand notes that you wanted to type, if you kind of had like a loose leaf piece of paper there, that's kind of what the notes is for you now. Um, right. And then one of the other new features was the print option where now you can print out the logbook and it will basically kill all the other extra stuff and give you a big, nice screen that you can print off of. Um, for anybody that's also looking for a screen with more maximized uh, logbook area, let's see if I can get back to it real quick. After you print that screen, it will have it in a different tab. So you can always kind of go back to it and see that real big logbook view where you've killed all the little widgets, but we're really looking at more logbook data. Um, and honestly, I really like the ability to print um, just to have that paper copy sometimes is real nice to just not have to get on the digital. Absolutely. Okay. Um, another question in the chat window, does this software keep track of databases like different converters, gears, class, et cetera, similar to like crew chief does. And I just want to make a statement that um, I don't care for that. Like, to me, that would be like literally having a new logbook every time I change converters. Like in my opinion, if I'm going to change converters from this week to next, it's going in the same logbook. It's going to go in the same database. I'm just not going to predict off of the runs with the old converter. I'm going to predict off the runs with the new converter. So that's just my take on that. Whether this software does it or not, I'll let Matt answer. But I feel like I want all the runs from the whole season with my Cobalt or Copo or whatever in one book. Like, exactly. And, and I'm, I'm right there with you. And the reason for is we want to be able to have that ability to just roll through the logbook pages and just really be able to see what everything is. Now, just like you said, if you did make a major change to the car, major change to the car setup, go to the cars and hit that clear prediction setup. And what it's going to do is now, instead of us predicting off of or uh, auto correcting off of these runs, which are no longer applicable because the car setup has changed, it will start a new database that we'll be using to auto complete those runs. Okay, cool. Um, next question. Hold on a second. Um, Tressa says, can you create a custom prediction curve for your 60 foot for track temperature? So you can customize the ET prediction to have any variable. So if you added a track temperature variable um, 
to your database, which you'd have to go into the views and add that variable and then add it for each run. We could come in here and go to whatever prediction formula you wanted. We would go to compare and we would select whatever that, that variable is. And it would then allow you to compare the previous runs value to the current run value. Um, actually, I take that back. In order to compare it to a new value, it has to be a weather variable. Um, so I don't have that at the moment. Um, I do have the ability to use the sunlight meter. Um, and that's part of the reason we have a sunlight sensor. So we've recognized that as the sun beats down on the track, it's going to change how the track temperature is and change how sticky the track is. So we've added a sunlight sensor to help identify that for you. So although it's not accurate 100% to track temperature, you can utilize the sunlight value and add it to your prediction and it will help you identify those, those changes with the track temperature. Um, the reality though, is in my experience, there is so much happening between rounds, between track prep, um, that it's almost track prep has got to be one of those things that is going to be in your gut. Um, there's just, whether they sprayed the prep, whether they dragged the track, whether the humidity set in and they didn't do anything, um, it, it's hard to make a, a, a computer program predict everything. So there's some things that do have to be in your gut. Like I said, we can add the sunlight to that prediction, but really track prep is, has got to be more of a, uh, a, a, a flyby, a gut feeling. Absolutely. Um, Matt, just to give you a heads up, we got like four or five minutes here to wrap up, but I want to just, if we can rapid fire answer a couple last questions sure. here. I'll try to make it quick. Um, Johnny says, uh, when you have it pulled up on the run prediction and you think you have a faster 60 foot, can you actually change your prediction? Like, does that make, like if your 60 foot is faster than you think, can you correct the 60 foot, which would then correct the run? It will correct the 60 foot, but it will not correct anything beyond that. But, um, but I think this goes back to, I'll answer this real quick, but this goes back to what you showed us, where if you think the, the, completion is incorrect you can just change the prediction so if you think you had a fast 60 foot and you're not going to have it again and you think your run should have been five thou eight thou slower you can just change it to five thou or eight thou slower yep and now you're predicting off of what you think that pass would have been with that weather that five hours from now is going to be in, in, important to predict off of absolutely okay mark asks can you talk a little bit about the throttle stop prediction can you can wind speed and wind direction be factored into that prediction? Yes. So the throttle stop prediction, it acts exactly like the junior dragster weight prediction we just talked about. So it's going to have your desired ET. It's going to select the prediction formula you use and then the timer adjustment. So if we were using, he could come over here and say, I want to use the Copo 376 and this is how much timer adjustment. And now instantly he's throttle stopping his Copo. And is, if he had that timer value, um, which he doesn't, but if he had a, a value in the timer field, um, then it would be able to predict that for him. And there's the timer right there. Okay, perfect. So then essentially, Mark, what he's saying is like, as long as like, like my Copo now has the prediction of wind built into it, it's gonna predict the wind in the throttle stop prediction, essentially. Um, the advantage and disadvantage of paging by text or pager, um, for me, if anybody that knows me, my phone never leaves my site ever. So I always have it. I don't have to worry about losing a page. I don't have to worry about nothing. Like that's my number one thing. And it's always with me. And I don't have some pager vibrating the heck out of the console in my car or whatever. Like, so that's why I like it. But the biggest difference between the two is the text messaging, text messaging. You have to have an internet connection to the trailer, which for some people is difficult. And some tracks is almost impossible. So in those regards, the paging aspect is going to be the most reliable aspect. Um, it is also an expensive option too. So take that into account. But the text messaging, I use the text message myself as well. I use my son's iPad and we've got it 3G connected specifically for this. And we just keep it in the trailer with the hotspot on. And when we're racing, that's my internet connection. That's cool. Um, Chris Whitfield just asked, he actually has your guys' Computech Datamax Dash. 
And he was curious, like how far away you are from streaming the weather and prediction straight to the dash. We are not actually as far away as you might think. I'm probably about a year away. We're working on a new data max dash. That's full color, full touchscreen. Um, that will ultimately be tied into this software. Ultimately, the Datamax software will, uh, this, this big program will absorb our data logger software as well. So when I talked about that, I'm trying to make the Microsoft Office, I wasn't kidding. We are making everything built into one pl pl place. This is going to be your entire database, your, your Bible for racing. This is everything. All right, cool. Well, Matt, listen, I really appreciate your time. I know we went a little bit over, um, but I really appreciate all of your time and insight. I'm sure the members do also. And uh, I want to encourage anybody, if you guys have extra questions that, that you either didn't post or that we didn't get to, whatever the case, do not hesitate to call Matt. They, they are there, uh, the family business, they're there every day. I, I think he might sleep there. We, we recognize that racers don't race Monday through Friday, nine to five. We're racers ourselves. So we make ourselves available in the evenings and the weekends. We forward the phones to our cell phones. So we get text messages. I get more text messages from customers than I get from people I know. So <laughs> you right, can text absolutely. me, you can call me, you can email me. I'm always available. And also, and this helps for a lot of people that are really scared about technology. I have the ability to take control of your computer and walk things through with you. So if you don't know what you're doing, I can literally take control of your computer and walk through it together. Cool. Well, Matt, again, I thank you so much for joining us. I know it was super informative and I realize for our members, there's a lot to take in with this. So if this is something that uh, we need to clarify, don't hesitate to call Matt. If I need to do an instructional video in the future and, and Matt and I do it together and post it, whatever we need, we'll, we'll make this work. But I think this software is super powerful. I use it a lot myself and, uh, Matt, we appreciate your time. And for everybody else, uh, don't forget we have uh, Mike Manns uh, with Fast Shocks coming up in about 20 minutes. So uh, hop back on and join us. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Matt.